past two weeks have been about experiments and statistics, so uh, let's talk about all of that. So the first bit is experiments. So we'll start with talking about papers and then different types of variables. So experimental papers will have things called uh, methodologies, result sections, and discussions. So when you do an experimental paper, what you're trying to do is you're trying to ask a research question, solve that research question by getting different uh, behavioral responses from participants. So you might have an hypothesis that says that people prefer one type of structure for ditransitives over another, and your job is to collect responses in order to prove that. So in the methodology section, this is where you lay out exactly what you are doing as far as the experiment and who you've recruited. So you give information about participants, you give the design as well as some example materials so people can follow along, and then you would also show how the experiment was done. That way other people can replicate that. The results section is where you contain uh, your statistics. So all of that information will be there. And the discussion section is where you elaborate on your results and tie them back in to all of the previous theory. So that is how all of that is done together. Here's an example of an experiment, one that I was involved in, so I know it quite well. This looked at singular they in different contexts. So there was one context where two people were eating together. Both of them know the gender of the server, so they're testing to see what pronoun is preferred. And another case, just one person is eating dinner. Uh, one person knows who what the gender of the server is, and then the person who was there is tweeting to other people. So when you're talking to people who don't know the gender, uh, which one is okay. So in the actual writing, they mention a two by two factorial design. So it tells you which variables they're manipulating, context and pronoun. So do they know the gender of the server or not? And which pronoun is being used, uh, a gendered one or a gender neutral one. Then each of these conditions are explained. So this is an example of the design of materials. They're describing how the experiment is set up theoretically, as well as giving some examples of the different test conditions. The procedure is where all of this is laid out. So it was carried out as an online experiment on IBEX, so that's where it's done. There's 16 test items. So this means there's 16 sentences they'll see that are being tested for this phenomenon. And there are 28 fillers. So you can think of fillers as being distractors. They're there to disguise what you're trying to test so participants don't get the idea and start manipulating their own results, whether consciously or subconsciously. So now it tells you what they did. So they received instructions to, re to read through each story and rate the naturalness of the target sentence. So on a seven point scale, and then it shows the process for what they did um, as far as practice items and surveys. So you can read all this in more detail if you'd like. Here is an example of a result section. So these are findings. So as you can see, there is a chart that shows things, basically saying there's no difference. They, she, uh, they and he and she are basically fine together, uh, no matter whether you know the gender or not. And then there's some descriptions of how the analysis was done. So it was done in this program. It's using this package. And we got p-values using a different package. So this is just statistical computing. Now, they didn't find any main effect or interaction, meaning that essentially all of the pronouns and conditions behaved the same. So that's what a result section would look like in a paper. And then there would be a discussion that would go into more detail and connect it to the grand scheme of things. So when you're doing an experiment, for looking at behavioral responses, typically when we design something, what we're doing is we're manipulating something behind the scenes and then we're taking a measurement. So uh, an independent variable, short of this IV, is something that you're manipulating. 
and the dependent variable called a dv is something you're measuring. So examples, you're measuring sentence structure to, sorry, you're manipulating sentence structure to measure reading time. Maybe you're uh, manipulating gender groups in order to measure some aspect of language. So here are some examples of independent variables. So you can control these variables. So something like the languages that you're studying or the languages of the participants, uh, the ages of the participants. So you can control whether um, you're looking at 18 to 24 groups, 24 to 36 groups in terms of age, and so on. These are things you can control. The measurements, the dependent variables, you cannot control these variables. The participants are going to respond in some way, and that is out of your control. You can tell them how you want them to respond, but you can't control their responses. So things like naturalness ratings or acceptability scores, reaction time, uh, if they're having a choice between one, two, or three options, uh, whichever one they choose is out of your control. These are measured variables. These are called dependent variables. So here's an example. Let's see if we can find our variables here. The following study analyzes three groups of L1 Mandarin speakers. So, okay, so there's one little group that could be potential or could be an IV if it's manipulated uh, in different age groups, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and 31 to 40. So, okay, so you have age groups, and this is an independent variable because the person is choosing participants and sorting them. This is in their control. Uh, each participant read an entire paragraph out loud while being recorded. Each recording was segmented into individual speech sounds to determine the length of the vowels in each verb, the loudness of the vowels in each verb, and the pitch of the vowels in each verb. So in terms of DVs, what we have are uh, V length. So the vowel length is something we're measuring. Uh, the vowel loudness is something we're measuring and the vowel pitch is something that we're measuring. So these are all different measurements. So you can say that we have three DVs in this case. Now it says the experiment was then repeated for L1 English speakers. So we actually are taking their L1 as an independent variable because we're essentially manipulating whether they're in the L1 Mandarin group or L1 English group on top of things. So two independent variables, age and L1 background. These are the things we're controlling for. And then length, loudness, and pitch of the vowel are things we're measuring. Those are dependent variables. Here's some common paradigms. Uh, one is called the self-paced reading paradigm. So this is where participants read a sentence on a screen, and normally the words that show up are controlled by the participant. So they'll hit something like a space bar whenever they want to see the next set of words, and then you're measuring those reading times for each uh, word or region. Another way you can do it is with eye tracking. So you can have them read a sentence on a screen and you can track to see how long they're spending at each word. So this would be an example of what a self-paced reading experiment would look like. So you have one word shown at a time, they press a key, the next word shows up and the previous one disappears. And this just continues to go on until the sentence is complete. So you can call this something like region one, region two, region three, region four, and so on. Now, what will happen is you'll get your reading times for each condition and you can plot them out on a little chart. So you can see whether or not all of these different points stay together. So we can see the reds here, which are sentences that cannot be true, they're infelicitous, uh, tend to take longer than the ones where the sentences are felicitous, as you can see there. So I'm just connecting uh, these colors with these lines. And we, can and we can see that continuing for another region, but then things tend to get better again towards the end. So we might actually see a difference here uh, based on reading times. Visual world is another common one. So the idea behind this one is that as you listen to people speak, your eyes fixate on that thing that they're talking about if it's available in your vision. So participants will listen to audio, their eyes will be focused on the center of the screen, 
And then as they listen to the audio, they will look at the different pictures if they're relevant. So uh, you can track to see how someone's processing information based on what they, uh, based on what they look at uh, while they're listening to words. Truth value judgments are another big one. So this is usually a person's first experiment, uh, some sort of task where people have to choose whether something is true or false. If you're doing semantics or syntax, this is what you'll do, normally in the form of a comprehension question to make sure people are paying attention. So you'll give them a sentence, you'll ask them a question about that sentence, and they'll say that's true or that's false, or yes or no. The forced choice task is another big one. So this is when you have multiple different options they can select from, and they're making a decision on something. So there is an example down here. So there's a nice little picture. Let me zoom in on this. Uh, here we have a box with a piece of tape, and there's two ways that we could describe this sentence. The tape is on the box, or the tape is stuck to the box. Uh, which one do you think is most natural for describing this event? So you'd pick either A or B. Sometimes there can be multiple more options, but an A and B is probably the easiest one uh, to do because you're only looking at two choices. We can also see a truth value judgment at the top here. So we'll show them a picture, perhaps in a study. The sentence is, the sandwich is on the plate. Is that true or false or yes or no? So now we'll talk a little bit about descriptive statistics. So this is how we can report information about our data sets. Uh, descriptions are just descriptions. They don't really prove anything. Um, they're just there to describe what you've got. So whenever you have an experiment and you have data, you have to ask whether or not you have a significant result. So descriptive statistics will describe your results and inferential statistics will tell you whether or not it's significant. So we have four things we'll talk about, and I'll go through each of them in turn. So the mode is just the most frequent value in a data set. So whether you're working with reaction times in milliseconds or naturalness ratings on a scale of one to seven, you can order your values so that way common ones are together, and then you can determine which one is the most frequent. So in this list of numbers, you have two. Five, five, seven, eight, seven, seven, uh, three, four, and two. So the most common number in the little set below is seven. So we say that is the mode. So in this case, the mode is seven. So this just tells you the result that is most popular doesn't really tell us anything about the data, but it says that when the majority of humans do this thing, this is the result that they get. This is the most common result. The mean is just the average. So what you do in this case is you would add up all of your values together and then divide by the number of values that you have. If you're doing like a reading time experiment and someone's reading 40 sentences and you have 30 participants, you have thousands of data points. So you do not do this by hand. The computer will do it for you. As a demo, uh, what we would do is we would add up all of these numbers, and then we would divide by the total number of things that there are. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we divide by eight, and that would give us a result. So this is 12, 14, 18, 21, 26, 33, 38, divided by eight. So we could just do some quick arithmetic in our heads and get 475. Or you could use a calculator. Anyways, uh, you're not going to be calculating anything difficult by hand here. Really, if a computer is not doing it for us, we're just sort of wasting our time. So the, me, uh, the median is going to describe the middle value. So in other words, like what is the center of everything that you found? So the trick here is to organize all of your data from smallest to largest. Again, a computer does this automatically. You find the center data point, and that is your median. Now, in the case of odd numbers, you have, say, five results. It's really easy to find a center point. It's just the third point in that group. So in this case, the median 
is equal to seven because that's the middle value. But if you have an even number of, of points, so one, two, three, and four, well, the center point there would be like two and a half. So what you do is you take the average of the two points surrounding that center, and that would be your median. So each of these two groups has the same median despite having a different number of values. One of the most important ones conceptually is variance or standard deviation. Uh, they're, they're different terms, but they're directly related to each other. Uh, the variance is just the standard deviation squared. And this is about spread. So if you have a bunch of responses, and let's say these are two curves that you have. So this white space here is where all of the responses are. So let's say this is a scale of one to seven. We'd say most of them here are between like say three and five. Or you could have another one where most of the responses are between two and six. So the standard deviation is basically telling you about that spread. So the smaller the standard deviation, the less spread there is in the data. So this would have a lower standard deviation, and the one on the right would have a higher standard deviation. We can also say variance that they will both hold. So to calculate this, you're basically taking, if we can draw this, let's pretend that this is your mean. So this is some value. I don't know, we can call this five. And we're basically taking the differences between our points and the mean. And then we're doing some math with those differences in order to calculate a standard deviation. So the math is laid out there. You'll never do this by hand uh, in this course. But that is the concept behind how you're getting that value. So the important thing to remember here is that standard deviation and variance are related to spread. Uh, how varied are people's results from each other? Lower standard deviation means most people act very similarly. Higher standard deviation means that a lot of people act differently from each other. So we can do an example here. So we have two groups of data, a uh, group one and group two. We can calculate the median, mean, and mode of each one. Uh, in for one calculated the median you would line the values up from lowest to highest uh, if you do that you'll see that both the medians are four so that's the middle value for the mean of each group uh, these have been nicely laid out to add up to 32 each so if we divide by the number of entries we get 32 divided by eight so both of the means are four now, as you can see in group one, the values are all pretty close to four, while in group two, we only see ones and sevens. So they end up with the same mean, even though the values are completely different. They end up with the same median too. So these two numbers on their own, the median and mean, aren't really going to tell you what the data looks like. What about the mode of each group? Well, four is the most common in group one, and for group two, one and seven, are most common in equal amounts. So you could say that there is no mode in that case. Now conceptually, which group has the larger standard deviation or variance? Well, this would be the group where the answers are spread uh, more than the other one. So if we think about group one, if we were to draw this on like a graph, really it looks something like this. So these would be the threes, these would be the fours, those would be the fives. So they're all pretty tightly uh, packed. Now, in terms of the other one, uh, this graph would look a little bit more like that, where the peaks are on the ones and sevens. So if we think about where the middle is in each of these data sets, and we think about the spread of the values compared to that middle point, uh, we can clearly see that this one, group two, is going to have a larger variance slash standard deviation than the one on the left, because on the right in group two, the values are further away from the mean there. Okay, so that would be group two.
So when we write about descriptive statistics, uh, we would write about it just as you would expect uh, to be brief, describe what happened, and give the values clearly in writing. So here's an example. There were 16 participants in the study divided into two groups, L1 English speakers and L1 Italian speakers. So the two independent variables have been uh, introduced. Or the one independent variable with the two groups. Uh, the average acceptability score for L1 English speakers and L1 Italian speakers were 5.56 and 2.34 respectively. So the values are just laid in there. Nothing really fancy. Table one displays the means and standard deviations of each group. We look at the table, we can see the mean, and we can see the standard deviation. The data shows that L1 speakers rated sentences more highly. So this can be seen by looking at the averages. 5.56 is higher than 2.34, and more consistently than L1 Italian speakers. So the more consistently can be seen from the standard deviations. So with the L1 English group, uh, the spread is a little bit tighter than the Italian group, which seems to have a larger spread. So that's an example. You can also put the standard deviations directly in the text. You would just use SD, or sometimes you see STD as well. In lowercase, to show those values, you would still need a chart. Uh, putting them in writing is not a way to get around a chart. So let's talk about inferential statistics, and this is all about understanding. It's a recap video, so it'll be brief. Um, really, again, just focus on core understanding. Don't worry too much about the mathematics or the technical details. Your goal here is to understand what certain tests mean and how they apply to certain experiment types. So that way, you, at least you understand what those numbers and symbols mean in writing. So to start off, with an experiment, you create a hypothesis. So this is what you're expecting. So your expectation is what is called the alternative hypothesis. So we'll understand why it's called alternative soon, and we usually symbolize this with H1. So your hypothesis could be people use subject, verb, direct object, indirect object, and subject, verb, indirect object, direct object with different amounts. So these are diatransitive verbs. And there's two different ways you can do them. I gave Mary the pen, I gave the pen to Mary, and our hypothesis is that they're used in different amounts. So people prefer one over the other. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis that is contrary to your hypothesis. So this basically assumes a uh, similarity. So there's not really any difference between things. It's really just the opposite of your alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis in this case would be people use SVDOIO and SVIODO the same amount. So basically, uh, this is like saying structure one is not equal to, to structure two. That's our, that's our hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that they're basically the same. So in statistics, we're not really trying to prove our hypothesis. We're trying to disprove the null hypothesis to say that it is so unlikely that these are not different that they therefore must be different. So the normal distribution is what a lot of tests are, are uh, compared against. So the normal distribution basically says that the median and the, the mean are the same thing. So what that means is that it's normalized. So if you think about standard deviations, it says that within one standard deviation of the mean, you have 68% of the population in that. So 68% of all responses will be within one standard deviation. If you go two standard deviations out, this now increases to be 95% of all responses and so on. So the idea is that human behaviors typically fall on a bell curve. So if you think about a reaction time, for example, you see a green light and then you hit a button as soon as you see it, uh, people might do it on average in say 250 milliseconds. And it's a lot more likely that you're gonna be getting a lot of scores in like say the 230s and 240s and 260s and 270s, because that's around what the average response is. 
So you get a lot of those responses, but you're not going to get very many responses that are in like the 150s or the 450s. Those are going to be more rare. And that's what the normal distribution tries to, to get at and tries to show. So IQ scores are done like this. So the average human is given 100. And then if you're smarter than the average human, you're above 100. If you're uh, not as smart as the average human, you're less than 100. So IQ tests are for pattern matching. So the idea is that 95% uh, of the population has an IQ between 68 and 132. And the remaining 5% are outside of those bounds. And these areas outside tending towards zero are called tails. So this is basically uh, each side of the normal distribution is a tail. Now, this will give us uh, a lead into to p values. So a p value is just a probability value. So if you see something like p equals 0 0.05, what this is saying is that the probability of something happening is 5%. So you just remove two decimal or two zeros and then you get your percentage. So if you say p is less than 0 0.01, that means that the probability of something happening is less than 0.1%. Now, all of these p values are describing the null hypothesis. So this is basically saying your similarities. So when you see a p value of less than 0.1%, you're really saying the probability of no effect, of no differences, is less than 0.1%. So you're not using the tests to prove that there is a difference. You're using the test to show that it's incredibly unlikely that there's no difference. Conceptually, it works out to mean roughly the same thing. It achieves the same result. Um, but we're just being, we're considering certainty, right? Because there's always a possibility that you could have two very extreme groups that land in some improbable situation or, or close to improbable situation. So the lower the p-value means the less likely it is that there's no differences, which means that it's more likely that your data is significantly different. So lower p-values are better. OK, so a t-test is used to compare a group of responses. So you're essentially comparing curves. So let's say we expect, uh, let me draw a better one here. Let's say we expect a distribution like this. And what you end up with is a distribution that looks like this. So uh, we can say that the expectation is blue, and we can say that the group that we got is uh, in pink. Now the question you have is, is our group significantly different from the expectation? And that is where t-tests come in. So it compares curves. You can either compare it against the standard normal distribution, which is what we're doing here, or what you can do is compare two groups. So you might have a group like that, and you might have a group like that. And you're comparing to see whether they're significantly different from each other. Now, it uses these things called Z values or Z values. And uh, it uses the standard error. So a Z value just corresponds to how far away uh, something is from a normalized distribution. So Let's say you have a bunch of numbers, like you're doing reaction time. You have numbers like 240 MS, 260 MS, 310 MS. What you can do is you can normalize them. So you can find the average. You can find where the mean is equal to the median, and you can say that's zero. And what you can do is you can take standard deviations. So one standard deviation is some score, uh, two standard deviations away is another score, and so on. Then what you do is you fit these values into the standard deviations. So a z-score really takes any number 
and is going to transform it into a score closer to zero that is symbolic of how many standard deviations it is away. So a z value of 1.6 means that it's 1.6 standard deviations away from the center. If you had 0 0.1, that means it's really close to the mean, essentially. So the t test, the t value that you get, you're going to get a result for t comes from this z value, and it also comes from the standard error. So it takes error into consideration. We're not going to go into the formula, but that's how a t score is, is derived. So uh, if I show you this right here, what you see here is a chart. So uh, your p values are at the top. You have this thing called degree of freedom uh, on the side. And essentially everything inside here are t values. So we'll talk about degrees of freedom later. Um, but essentially, you check your t value. You see how many stand, uh, degrees of freedom you have. So let's say you have a let's say you have a df of one, and you have a t value of sixteen. Well, we take a look, and then in the first row, so in the first row there, we see sixteen. So sixteen is with, is in this range between twelve point seven one and thirty one point two. So uh, we're in this p-value range between 0.02 and 0.05. That's, that's what our p-value is going to be. Now, this is how they did it in the old days. Nowadays, just use a computer. OK, so here's a sample experiment, and then we'll talk about the test here and everything in detail. So let's say we want to see if there's a gender difference in reading times of 10-letter words. This is an absurd experiment. We're not going to find any differences, but let's just pretend. So one thing we're going to uh, measure is participant gender. Uh, let's just assume it's, you know, old school, traditional gender uh, for the sake of this example. And we're going to measure reading time. So reading time is our dependent variable. This is collected in milliseconds. So our hypothesis, H1, so this is ours, will say that there is a difference. That means that the null hypothesis it's going to be the opposite and say that there's no difference. So our test is going to check the probability of there being no difference. Now, what we're expecting here is milliseconds. So we're, we're expecting like two curves of some sort. And we don't know how those are going to come out. We want to see if those curves are significant. So we would use a t-test for that case. Now, t-tests are directional. So if you have what's called a one-tailed t-test, this means that in the curve, you're really just investigating one side. So, so you're investigating a particular direction. Is something skewed more in one direction than the other? So that would be one-tailed. If it's two-tailed, this means that you're not really specifying a direction. You're just looking for difference. So it's really like the ends that you care about, both ends. So if you're ever comparing curves, you're looking for a greater than or less than relationship or just a different relationship, this is where you would use a t-test. So here's a nice little example of what you'd be looking for, sort of the areas you're focusing on. And that would be the chart to calculate it. So which type of t-test would you use for these hypotheses? One, ain't appears more often in a corpus than am not. So what you're, what you're doing here is basically comparing, uh, well, you'd be doing a test in one direction more often. So if you're going to do this one, you'd be doing one-tailed. Left-handers process auditory information at a different speed than right-handers. So you're not specifying the direction here. So you're looking at a two-tailed t-test. Now, uh, that's for normal curves, or normal distribution-like curves. We have a different type of experiment here. This is a classification task. So basically, participants are going to hear U, and they're going to say whether or not they hear it as he, uh, sorry, as E or U. So it's like a calculus. It's, it's like a balls and boxes kind of test. You have two different boxes. 
people are going to put in their responses, and then you're going to get a number at the very end. So if you want to see if there's going to be a difference in classification, you basically have to check to see if the differences in number of people for E and U is different. So you're not getting a bunch of things like milliseconds. You're not getting a bunch of data from one person with different values. What you're doing is you're sorting responses into different buckets. So our hypothesis here is that there's going to be a different amount of E's and U's, and the null hypothesis will be that they're not different. So this is where we use something called the chi-squared test. So I'll write that out for you, C-H-I and then squared. So a chi-squared task is for basically seeing whether amounts in different buckets is significant or not. And what this does is it compares how many you observe with how many you expect. So let's say for this EU task, we have 50 participants, and what we expect is that uh, participants don't really care. So if you think about the null hypothesis, it would say there's no difference. So you would expect 25 in each one. So this would be our expectation because the null hypothesis says no difference. So we expect there to be no difference. So 50 participants, that means 25 in each. Uh, we do some math here. We won't talk about the formula, um, but we can get a result. So let's say we do that task, number of oohs and number of e's. We expect 25 in each, we get 29 oohs, and we get 21 e's. Now, if we do math, we're going to get the chi-squared value. So we're basically taking the difference squared divided by the expectation, difference squared divided by expectation, you get the chi-squared value. So if we take a chi-squared value and we take a degrees of freedom value, what we're going to get is uh, a p-value. So this will tell us how significant it is. So if we have 29 u's and 21 e's, do you think it's significant or not? Do you think that uh, participants have a preference towards one or the other in general? Well, we have to show that that would be uh, likely. So in order to calculate the degrees of freedom, what you do is you take the number of outcomes and just subtract one. So in this case, you could say OO or you could say E. That's two outcomes, so subtract one, then one is going to be our degree of freedom. So we can take a look at the chart. Degree of freedom is in the first row. Our chi squared value from before was 1.28. So 1.28 would lie in the middle of 0.9 and 0.1. So this means that our p-value is going to be between 0.1 and 0.9. So this is not going to be significant because when we look for significance, really we're looking for everything that's 0.05 and below. So a 5% chance or less. So when we go back to this data, our conclusion is that the groups aren't significant. We don't have evidence that they're not like the same. So this is likely just by chance that we don't get our expectations. So the fact that we're getting 29 and 21 instead of 25 and 25 isn't because of some effect, it's just by chance. So thinking about the chi-squared and t-tests, uh, which test will be used for each one of these? Ain't appears more often in TV than in newspapers. So this is where you'd use chi-squared. And you think about, say, TV, you think about the newspapers, and you would basically do the number. You might even do proportion. So if there's no difference, let's say you would expect 0.1% of all words in TV and news to be ain't. OK, so then we get some actual value. Uh, proportion is just a way if there's different number of words uh, then, you know, you're not working with raw values. What about if gender neutral pronouns take longer to read than gendered pronouns? So here, we're likely going to see two different curves. See a curve for gender neutral pronouns, a curve for gender pronouns. We're basically checking to see whether or not they're significantly different curves. So this would be a t-test. 
And specifically, we're saying longer to read. So this is in one direction, so it's going to be a one-tailed t-test. Now, those were all designs with one independent variable. When we get two independent variables, the designs become much more complex and statistics becomes much more difficult. So I'll just show you one way to analyze that. So when you have two IVs or more, you're basically looking to see if there's an effect of each one and you're looking to see if there's an interaction. So you get these things called factorial designs. So if you have a three by three factorial design, what this means is you have one IV with three conditions and another IV with two conditions. So let's say you're doing vowel height, so you could use high, mid, and low, three different conditions, and you're doing depth, so front, center, and back, three different conditions. Now each of these can combine with the other one to make different vowels, right? Like we have a high front vowel E, a high center vowel uh, I, a high back vowel U, and so on. So that would be one example of a design. And then from there, you'd be collecting some sort of dependent variable. Here's another one with handedness, so two by four. So we have IV1 handedness, it's either gonna be left or right. And then we have four, so IV2, which is the manner of the sound. So stop, fricative, affricative, or liquid. Uh, these are just, again, arbitrary experiments just to demonstrate things. So when we take a look at our total design, we'd have a condition for left-handed stops. So left-handed participants listening to stops, left-handed participants listening to fricatives, and so on, and then right-handed affricates, right-handed liquids. So in the end, you really just have to multiply these numbers together and you get the number of different conditions that you have. So with this, we need to use a two-way ANOVA. There are a lot of other methods that you can use um, you'd have to take a stack course or really just do independent research to figure these out. This is just like the intro method that everyone is taught because a lot of other methods uh, are more complicated. So this analyzes interaction. So does one independent variable have an effect on the other? So it tests three different null hypotheses. It says there's no difference within a, a independent variable one. So let's say there's no difference in handedness, doesn't matter if there's left or right, that's one thing it tests. Uh, there's no difference in the second independent variable. So let's say manner doesn't make a difference for some reason. And then there's no effect of the two independent variables interacting with each other. So basically there's no special case of handedness and manner that is significantly different. So one question you could have is, is there a difference in perception of U based on handedness and gender. So here, this would be a two by three design, as you have two different conditions for handedness and three different conditions for gender there, male, female, and non-binary. So you'd end up with six different conditions. So what the null hypothesis would say is there's no difference in handedness, there's no difference in gender, and there's no combination of the two that would be special. So to calculate the F value, I'm not gonna show the formula, basically, it takes the variation of the group means and divides them by the means of the variations or the variances. So um, basically it just considers difference in, in a fancy way. So here's an example. Results, an analysis of variance on sentence types and age groups revealed main effects of sentence types. So main effects is when you're just looking at one independent variable. So uh, IV1 or IV2. So there's a significant effect of sentence type. So sentence type is listed here. So it says a probability of p-value of less than 0 0.001 and an f-value of 10.6. So again, we just looked these up in charts. Uh, there's a difference in age group as well. So p-value less than 0 0.001 and an interaction between the two. So that means that uh, age group and sentence type interact with each other. One has an effect on the other in some case. Now, these numbers inside the F values, so DF1 and DF2, correspond to degrees of freedom. So the first value you see, for example, the two here, is the standard uh, degree of freedom that you're used to from uh, chi-squared tests. DF2 is a little bit more complicated. Basically, it's the number of 
uh, data points you get, and then you subtract the number of conditions that there are. So DF2 is typically a much larger number than DF1. You don't really need to understand exactly what those mean. It's just more information about uh, what test you used and what values you put in uh, to calculate that alongside your data. So uh, that is it for this lecture. I know it's quite fast to do uh, basically four hours of lecture in 45 minutes. Again, uh, what you're really trying to do is just understand the big picture. So ANOVAs are used in the case where you have multiple independent variables. Chi-squared tests are used when you're looking at categories to compare like proportions or a number of times that certain things go into certain categories. And uh, t-tests are used when you're comparing like ranges of scores. So these things that follow a normal distribution to see if the curves are significantly different or not. And depending on whether it's directional or not, you have one and two tail t-tests. So that's really the core things we're trying to get out of this. And just to show in writing uh, what an F value is. So an F value corresponds to an ANOVA. Uh, a chi-squared value corresponds to a chi-squared test. A P value is about the probability. A T value corresponds to T tests. And these are just things that we look up in charts to figure out what the P values are, depending on how many degrees of freedom we have and depending on what our score is for that T score, that chi-squared score, that F score. So that's it for that lecture. See you uh, this week.